welcome back. Ukrainian forces are slowly advancing on a key city in the east of that country after a daring drone attack on a Russian airbase killed three Russian soldiers. And as the fighting rages on in Ukraine and now a little bit in Russia too, Ukraine's foreign minister says he hopes to hold a peace summit as soon as the end of February. For more, let's bring in ABC News contributor, former senior CIA field operative Daryl Blocker. Daryl, good to see you. Uh, let's start with this Ukraine attack inside Russia. This has happened a few times in this war. This one deep, 400 miles or so for Russia. They've hit this base before. So what does this raid say uh, about Ukraine's ability and what, it, what message or what, what, what goals it has in hitting Angles Air Force Base? We're looking at a map so deep in Russia. So the Ukraine has always had this capability as soon as the West sided with them, but exercising that capability is a completely separate uh, scenario. And I don't think up until now they felt comfortable launching inside of Russia outside of the attack on uh, Putin's um, religious advisor. So hopefully they're not claiming responsibility and that they can not disrupt any type of peace negotiations that might be in the works. Right. Well, let, let, let's get that. They, they are carefully tr draw, uh, walking the line, as you suggest, Daryl, between, you know, saying, yeah, well, Russia, you know, needs to know that it will pay a price, but we didn't, we don't know, we aren't commenting on who did what. But Ukraine's foreign minister, as you note, says he hopes that there will be a peace summit in February. He wants uh, the United Nations to be uh, the venue for that, but... Uh, it says Russia is only going to be invited if Moscow is first prosecuted for war crimes. And, and uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov of Russia now says, you know, they'll only join if Ukraine gives up the resistance, as he called it, stops fighting. So none of this sounds really promising, does it? Uh, honestly, it does sound promising, Terry, because they've gone with their most extreme positions. The Ukraine saying we're not going to enter negotiations until uh, humanitarian uh, and hu human rights violations have been prosecuted. And then the Russians saying the same about uh, giving up land. Now, that entire process, meaning going to the ICC, is not a short process. So it's really unreasonable for the Ukrainians to expect uh, Russia to you know, not be involved in negotiations at all. And uh, we'll see where that goes. It does suggest something about the fighting. So let's talk about the fighting. Uh, right now, it looks like Ukraine, a winter offensive of some kind against a key city in, in the eastern part of, of the country. But, Daryl, I'm just wondering about Ukraine's ability to sustain this, this level of, of fighting and of maneuver that they've undertaken with such spectacular successes in so many parts of the country. I mean, can they really keep it up? What do you, how, what's your read on the fighting there? Well, if anything is proven over the last 10, 10 or 11 months is that the Ukrainian resolve is far greater than the Russian invaders. So I do think that they have the capability of holding on as long as the world maintains uh, support of them. A lot of the weaponry that they're getting was actually slated to, to be mothballed. Um, but they're able to put it to good use. I'm sure that there's equipment from the Afghan pullout that's being involved. And then all the other uh, NATO nations and, and people who supported uh, the United States efforts are behind them as well. It's more than just the United States that's helping and, and help arm them. And, and so it looks like, you know, there, as you say, I think very rightly, that their will to continue, they, they just are not going to submit to what Russia wants. And, and now that you know, a week has gone by, I want to ask you that we have you here, of President Vladimir Zelensky's really remarkable trip to the United States last week and that address that he gave to a joint committee of Congress. What, what did you make of that? Well, as I, I, I believe he's the only second wartime uh, head of state to come and address a joint session of Congress with Churchill of course, during World War II being being the last one. So I thought it was brave of him. I thought it was brave of the Biden administration to bring him here. And I think it shows even more so that Russia has quite frankly been a paper tiger in all of this. And oligarchs to folks rising up in the street against Putin 
And we need to be able to discern between what's Putin's responsibility and what's the responsibility of the greater Russian government. We are going to have to negotiate with the greater Russian, uh, whoever's left behind after Putin. But Putin should be the person that the focus is on and not Russia writ large. And that's good advice. It does look like uh, th this is a disaster for Putin personally, but uh, that very opaque system, you know, who can dislodge him and what would come next? I think that we'll probably be having conversations about that at some point in the future. Daryl, Daryl Blocker, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.